Okay, hi everyone. So, very happy to introduce last talk of the evening on Friday here at the EMF camp. And it's uh, yeah, Kate Devlin talking about uh, sex robots. So, here you are, Kate. <laughs> I like to think you're clapping me and not the sex robots. A um, little bit of an announcement from the organisers. They say that there may or may not be demo sex robots available for volunteers. You will only find out if you sign up for a volunteer slot. <laughs> Three hours might get you a go. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not entirely safe for work, but I'm keeping it fairly clean. But this is a little run through the headlines of the past couple of years. So about four years ago, I started researching sex robots because it seemed like a fun thing to do. I was in the pub um, after a conference. We got a bit drunk and talked about where AI could go in the future. So I've been working in AI and HCI for a number of years. And this seemed like a, a brave new world to explore. And at the time, it wasn't being taken at all seriously. And so every time I said, I work on sex robots, so I get a lot of academic eye rolling. That's not a real subject. But it turned into a real subject, um, and it turned out to be quite a, a popular one. Although you try getting funding for it, it's impossible. Um, so two years ago, I talked to EMF Camp about the start of the work. And since then, since 2016, I've written a book on it, which involved a year of really in-depth trawling through all the information ever. It's been fascinating, and it's been fun. And along the way, I kept encountering headline after headline after headline and despairing at some of them. I'm going to share them with you and explain why most of them are completely wrong. It starts with exterminate. <laughs> Sex robot festival that was once banned for being too extreme is coming to Britain this Christmas. This was in 2016. And what happened was, there was the second annual Congress of Love and Sex with Robots, and it was due to be held in Malaysia and um, at Adrian Cheok's Imagineering Lab. The Malaysian police got wind of this, and they weren't happy. It's a very conservative country. It's unsurprising that they weren't very happy. So they decided to move the conference to London to, should I name the university? Yeah, oh, they were going to move it to City University, where um, Adrian Cheok um, held a chair. But um, City didn't want it. They were worried about the reputation. At the time, I was at Goldsmiths, and <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm just not anymore because I've just, just left. But um, Goldsmiths is incredibly progressive about these things and liberal and all that sort of stuff that it's renowned for. And so when I said, is it all right if I hold a, a conference on sex robots, they went, yes, of course. You know, they, they, they weren't in the slightest bit phased. So we sent out a press release on the Friday um, top tip, never send out a press release on a Friday. It's very hard to get it retracted um, over the weekend when people make huge errors, like reporting there's a festival where people can have sex with robots. <laughs> we had to phone them up and say, it's not a festival, I'm sorry, and no, we don't have any robots. We're talking about the technological, ethical, legal aspects of this. Anyway, we, we held the conference. There were about 50 academics and about 40 journalists that turned up. <laughs> it was absolutely great. It was great. It was really nice because actually the journalists all pitched in. Everyone got really involved. We had loads of really good debates. And by tea time on the first day, we had about eight stories in the national press. And I was getting phone calls from Germany and the Netherlands. Um, by and large, it was reported fairly well. Um, so if, you're, if you work for The Mirror, for example, well done, The Mirror's tech team did a really good job. Um, this was the one that surprised me because it was tabloidy. Um, by contrast, the worst offenders, the most egregious, were The Express. Boo. The Express um, don't like the truth to get in the way of a good story. Um, likewise, The Sun. So um, we had Robot Fours which is one of my favorite. This sex robot shocker, almost half of all men will use erotic robot playthings, says survey. It was a survey of about 260 people. Um, there was a lot of extrapolation going on in the Express because the people who'd done the survey, they, even they were saying, this is a survey of 260 people. This is, this is just a, an initial survey. So, it was very interesting to watch how it was reported because, of course, it got completely out of hand and, and all sorts of things were coming out. 
And I talked at the conference, I, I, I did a, a keynote at it. Um, and I talked a lot about privacy and security, which came up as sex robots could reveal your deepest perversions to complete strangers. Now there's some, there's some basis for this. So there've been several smart sex toy hacks over the past few years. The Wii Vibe is one of the most famous. There was a multi-million dollar out of court settlement because Wii Vibe were, um, they were recording data every minute of use of their vibrator. And they weren't just recording sort of settings and patterns of vibration. They were also recording things like vaginal temperature. Um, which they said they needed to make sure the device was functioning properly. Now we know that it's not, it's not that weird to be monitoring your devices and getting information sent back if you're a manufacturer. The problem was they hadn't anonymized it and they had linked everyone's data with their email address that they'd registered on the app with. Yeah. <laughs> so hence the multi-million pound settlement. Um, there's another couple of um, similar ones. The Slimy vibrator, which is a, a vibrator, well, a dildo actually, doesn't vibrate, um, with a camera on the end, which, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, people want that, it's a product that people buy, um, no kink shaming. So yeah, there was a camera on the end, and so it was widely reported that you could hack into the video feed and you could see the pictures from this camera. In actual fact, there are people out there doing a lot of white hat hacking on, on um, sex toys. People um, like Brad Haynes, who does um, Internet of Dongs project, and he said, well, yeah, you can, but you'd have to be within three meters of the device, and quite frankly, you might as well look through the window and see what they're doing. <laughs> so so there, are, there, there are a lot of security and privacy issues, but of course, we know that it's not just, um, you, know, you, you sign up to use things, you, sign, you take the terms and condition boxes, um, but when it comes to sexual data, people are much more wary. Um, Sarah Jimmy Lewis has got a wonderful book on this called Queer Privacy. She put a vibrator on Tor that could be controlled via Tor to show that you could have completely anonymous control of teledodonics, which is a really interesting project. But we know that if that data falls in the wrong hands, that's where it could be problematic. In the same way that we saw Stanford coming out with the, the AI gaydar paper that said it could tell whether or not someone was gay by looking at their picture, which is a severely flawed study and one that is downright dangerous in the wrong hands. So there is a lot to think about around, around privacy and security. I then said, foolishly, in my talk, what about people who are marginalized for one way or another? Perhaps they um, are not having the fulfilling sex lives that they want to have. Shouldn't we use sex technology to maybe enhance their lives? The Express translated this as sex robot should be put in all people's homes, says expert. I love this because they call me an expert. That was great. <laughs> Um, but I stand by it, I stand by it. And so I did a lot more work on this when I was looking at my book, reading, writing my book. And there's the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and it shows that people are, have active sex lives in their 80s and 90s. There's a lot of people still wanting to have sex, being unable to, because they're put into nursing homes, they're infantilized, they're taken away perhaps from, separated from a long-term partner, or a partner has died. They're not, they don't have much privacy. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's not locks in the doors. Sometimes there's windows in the doors. Um, their carers don't want to know about that side. And sure, there are issues when it comes to consent around things like dementia. That's another case entirely. But um, there, is a, there is a need in many ways for devices and for sex technology, and not just for sex, but for intimacy as well, to be extended right out across many different groups. And I, and I do think that older users is one of them. Um, and then um, about a year later, um, along came Grace and Frankie, if anyone watches that, and they were building and designing vibrators for, for older women with arthritis, and I thought, this is great, this is, this is what should be happening. This, this intrigued me. So again, with the Express, end of sex, scarily real sex robots to replace women as men can't tell the difference. Oh, come on. I mean... <laughs> They're not that dumb. <laughs> um, I laugh at this. And then the, the, the male, not to be outdone, the male were actually slightly better at reporting it, but um, sex between husbands and wives will only be for special occasions because robots will satisfy everyday needs, experts predict. I, I don't know who these experts are that are predicting it because um, it, wasn't, it wasn't anybody in that conference. 
Um, now, the, one of the, the, the subheaders here was there are fears teams could lose their virginity to robots in the future. And that came out of a comment that um, Noel Sharkey made at the Cheltenham Science Festival. He didn't even mean it like that either. He was just saying, oh, well, of course, you know, you could have these absurd scenarios like, of course, the male jumped on it as the truth. So uh, this idea that, that humans are going to be replaced by robots this is a very natural fear. This is a dystopian fear that we all have. And it's about loss of agency. It's about this worry that we're going to be replaced and automated. But as for not being able to tell the difference between women and sex robots, I'd just like you to uh, look at the evidence. <laughs> I don't think we're in any danger just yet of mistaking them. So on the left is a sex robot known as Roxy. Um, Roxy True Companion. Now she was one of the first models to come out and she is supposed to have different functions, like different modes. So she's got Wild Wendy and um, Frigid Fire and all this thing. The problem with Roxy, she gets a lot of flack. Um, she's a bit rubbish. Um, the problem is she doesn't really exist. She's pretty much vaporware. So the guy that, and I have to be very careful here because he's quite litigious. The guy that says he's selling these has never actually produced a model to show everyone other than this one trade show model. So all this fuss around, have we got this robot with this frigid setting, it, it doesn't really exist. And people, time and time again, have tried to find an example of this robot and have never managed to get a demonstration. So that's, that was sort of the initial foray into the sex robot world. The middle one is the first commercially available sex robot today. It, it was um, released in April. Um, I know I'm gendering already by saying she, but she's called Harmony. Harmony's made by Abyss Creations who make real, doll, real dolls. Um, she's not really a robot. She is animatron has an animatronic head, but she's completely stationary from the neck down. Um, and I went to see the workshop where they make these, and it's incredible. I went out there expecting to be pretty horrified because you know, it's really sort of pornified, hypersexualized not a really good representation of women. But what I saw was very skillful, crafted works of art that also happen to be fortified and highly sexualized. Um, but in terms of the AI, so she has, she has an AI personality and it can stand alone as an app. So you can already now, you can go and, I think it's like $20 um, for an Android app that is essentially a conversational AI that's actually not bad. And you can tweak her personality. It's got a pretty good user interface actually. The UX is very good on it. Um, you can tweak her personality, you can have her being flirtatious or sexy or friendly or caring or loving or whatever. Um, and, so, and so this is the state of the art. This is where we are at with this. Um, and it's only just, they're only just being made. They're about $10,000 um, and you basically get a head that you can put on a, on a, on a sex doll's body. Um, I've got a little video I'll show you in a second of that. Now the one on the right, this is Samantha, a robot that's been in the news a lot as well. Samantha made by um, Sergi Santos from Barcelona. And he and his wife were building versions of Samantha um, in, basically in his garage. He sold about 25 of these um, in the past couple of years. And Samantha's an interesting one. He, he's worked quite well on the AI. It's, it's not bad. Um, it's got interesting responses going on. He's trying to build it so that you, you have to woo the, the, the robot. You have to be, be courteous to her and you have to sort of arouse her in order for her to respond. So he's quite interested in the idea of reciprocation in, in, in the robot. Whether or not that works is another thing. So this is, this is Harmony and I'm hoping this sound will work just because when you hear her voice, Maybe not. Very well. I can't wait until we're alone. I've got a special surprise for you. She's got a Scottish accent. <laughs> it's really strange. So, <laughs> try and play it again. I will wait for the right moment. Oh. Replay. How are you today? Very well. I can't wait until we're alone. I've got a special surprise for you. It's just so, it's so incongruous um, seeing this very Barbie-esque doll with this very soft, gentle Scottish accent. And 
That's Matt McMullen, the sculptor who set up Real Doll. It's in the video there. And he said he'd chosen a lot of um, text speech voices before settling on the Scottish one because he said it sounded, it sounded the most interesting and the, and the sort of warmest that he could find. There is another version as well, Solana. Solana has an American accent. That's, she's just been released too. They're also bringing out a male version. So most of the dolls, the, the sex dolls, the love dolls that they sell are predominantly female dolls, female bodied dolls, and they're mostly sold to heterosexual men. And they do have a male bodied doll as well, um, which they um, say are, there are occasionally women who buy them, it's often gay men who are buying them. Basically, but you can build them to your specs, you can customize the genitals that you want in the, in the body of the doll that you want. But in this case, it's the head that has the animatronics um, and not the body, so you can basically fit the head on any of their bodies. It's a modular sex robot. So that's what I mentioned there was the, the um, Roxy True Companion robot, and there was a lot of um, talk in the, in the news about this idea of allowing men to simulate rape with this doll, would, would it, this, this robot, would it lead to increased sexual violence? And I spent a lot of time looking into this in a lot of different studies, and it's, unfortunately, it's the same way we see with a lot of things. There's evidence to suggest both sides. It's pretty much similar to the computer games and violence argument. So people say, oh, well, it will lead to increased violence. Other people say, well, there's absolutely no evidence of it. We can see that the same thing happening as well. You see it around um, internet porn accessibility too. And it's the same thing. We just don't have the evidence. To my mind, the evidence says that given the extensive um, access to pornographic material online, it's very unlikely there's a proportional rise in sexual violence, but there are changes to social acceptance. So we have to look at what the boundaries are for that. So there are certainly things to keep an eye on and maybe be concerned about, but in terms of this idea that having sex with a robot will lead to increased sexual violence, I just don't see that at all. And in fact, the people I talked to, I talked to a lot of the doll owners, the sex doll owners, and pretty much every single one of them was very respectful and reverential of their dolls. They dress them up, they take them out, they treat them really well, they give them personalities and backstories. And far from being isolated and lonely, they've actually formed a community where they are, have become friends with other doll owners um, and they meet up and, and they hang out together and it's actually community building rather than anything else. And I think it's, they're, they're very much maligned community where people think that this is something incredibly dangerous or incredibly perverted, but actually it's, it just doesn't seem that way at all. Now the, the big story from the past sort of six months to a year was that um, the Samantha robot was molested at a trade show and this was really uh, went, kicked off a lot of discussion about the same sort of thing around sexual violence. So I went to find out what actually happened. And it turned out that the creator of Samantha had taken her to display her at a trade show. And so he had this, it, just, it wasn't a sex show or anything like that, it was just an electronics you know, trade show. And he had her sitting there and said to people, oh, yeah, you, you can touch, you know, to see what it's like. And so they did. And of course, if you put something on display and you tell people they can touch it, they touch it and they poke and they prod and everything like that. And it's, it's fragile material. And he said himself, you know, it takes a while to learn how to handle these. And so it did get damaged, yes. But the newspapers reported it as an assault on the doll, when actually it was pretty much like putting a museum object on display and saying, yeah, go ahead, touch it. You're gonna get damaged. So I think there was a lot of hype there around something that wasn't actually the case. There's a really dark side to a lot of this stuff that has not been fun to look into or write about. Um, there's a lot of worry that, you know, what the, the big questions, what happens if someone makes a childlike version of these? Currently there are, there have been something like 123 arrests or seizures in the last year and a half of people trying to import childlike sex dolls. Um, it's not illegal to possess them in this country, it is illegal to import under a very archaic importation law on obscenity. Um, there, are, there are people who say they should be banned completely. There are others who say, well, perhaps this could be used in a therapeutic setting. And again, we don't have any evidence either way. I would be inclined to lean towards regulation because this isn't something that mirrors a consensual relationship in society. This is something much darker um, that involves exploitation and vulnerability. Um, so 
There have been studies in, um, in Canada around using virtual reality to see whether or not sex offenders are rehabilitated by putting them into virtual environments to test, whereas you couldn't do that in real life. And that's shown promising ways of checking rehabilitation, whether or not we can put a sex robot, a, a 3D product into that is, is another something else to look at. And the people who do those tests have suggested that that would not be a good idea. There are um, this, this idea that the China's disturbing sex robot factory in the headlines. These are not really factories, these are just basically workshops. They're not, this is not large scale production at all anywhere. Um, but there are dolls that are created that are smaller in size and that certainly could be mistaken as being childlike. Um, and it is, it's, it's pretty grim. And then we get to incels. <laughs> um, so, I'm <laughs> laughing because it's just so grim. Um, I spent a lot of time trolling through incel forums. Um, following the attacks, um, this I, there were lots of opinion pieces came out. You know, what incels need is, is sex robots. If we redistribute sex, we'll have a, a much safer environment, and that's just bullshit. Um, so this idea, first of all, that you can redistribute something like sex is really weird. Um, it's, you know, it's not it's not a, a right. It's 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 more it's a privilege um, but the idea that you can give someone a robot I looked in these forums and people are saying yeah what they you know, they were poor self-reporting it would be great if we had the perfect guy know the perfect woman who was robotic and served us in every way they basically want a programmable woman but would it you know would it, if you give if you give people who were very very misogynistically unhappy that do you think it would cure them of their misogyny I really don't see that happening at all so um, I would say that, that those, those got a lot of coverage, those, those things, and um, Toby Young chipped in um, with, with his take on it, you know, his usual way of doing that, about three weeks after everyone else. Um, here's what every Toby Young needs is more friends. Uh, so, but it's, um, I think that that was, I can see this sort of well-intentioned thing, oh, we can have a robot that will serve this role in society. I don't think that this is the, t the place to do it because essentially this is by and large the whole market is pretty much a gimmick in my opinion it's a very niche very small gimmicky market and I don't think that it's going to go anywhere I don't think it's going to change society I don't think it's going to change relationships I think it's very interesting but it's not going to have mass impact on society um, so back, back in July, uh, sex with robots may not be healthy, says new study. Well, it didn't say that. What it says was, we don't know if it's healthy or not. But everyone said, oh, it's not going to be healthy. Um, basically, what, what it actually said was, it's not proven. So there's a couple of, um, I think it's a couple of medical doctors had looked through all the literature and said, we can't find any evidence of anyone benefiting from having sex with a robot. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Spent four years doing pretty much that. There's no evidence of it. We're completely um, unsure what's going to happen. But what I'd say about sex or what's is that there currently are two pe two groups of people who are interested, and there are the people who are the sex doll owners, people who buy high end, upscale, high market sex dolls, um, and the people who want that companionship in a human like form. The people who, if that robot or that doll was to turn into a human would be really happy. So the sort of Pygmalion story, there are those groups. And there are the groups who are interested in it from an engineering perspective. There are quite a few of those. I, I, I am as well. I think it's really interesting engineering-wise. And then there are the people who have the uh, androidism fetish, people from... Um, basically, it, it, it is a kink, and the kink is that they are machines, that they are robots. So I think it is still very, very niche. Um, I don't think that this is going to happen, so I don't think that sex robots <laughs> may literally fuck us to death. Um, this came out of a, a conference paper by Rogue AI, so it's essentially Nick Bostrom's um, paperclip maximizer, what happens social's apprentice-like if you can't switch it off, and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. You know, it, but so there were there were happy headlines too. So so don't worry about them. They they won't ruin sex. I would say that's probably the most realistic headline, but it doesn't really grab you quite the way that some of the other headlines do. But where it went from this, so uh, the more I looked into this, the more I thought, well, why why are people so worked up about this? This is not really something realistic at all. But there's 
the interesting thing is that sex robots have come from the lineage of the sex doll. The sex doll's been around for years and years and years, like sort of the earliest reports are kind of like 17th century. Sex toys, on the other hand, they're much more interesting. They've been around for like 30,000 years um, in many different forms. We have stories, legends, myths all about, you know, we have, we have evidence, we have paintings, carvings, statues, sculptures. So interesting the way sex toys have evolved because up until the, the late 20th century, they just weren't mentioned, they were very taboo. And it wasn't until Sex in the City showed an episode with a vibrator that suddenly it became much more open, that you could talk about it a bit more. Now, the whole point of that Sex in the City episode was to shame Charlotte into getting a boyfriend, because apparently it wasn't good enough that she just relied on a sex toy. Um, but it broke boundaries in that people began to go and buy these. And the interesting thing about the vibrator in that episode was it was a rabbit vibrator. So it didn't look like any of the vibrators that had gone before, which were either genital replicas or a Hitachi magic wand. And so the, I, the whole point of the rabbit vibrator came out of um, obscenity laws in Japan where you weren't allowed to create replica genitals. And from that, we feel this emergence of a really, really interesting um, branch of design and sex toys where it moved away from the realistic and the skeuomorphic and into something much more interesting and abstract. And that's what captured my imagination. I was thinking, we have so many cool materials now. Why are we not doing something with those? And why are we not really pushing the boundaries of what we can do with the sex technology? And there are lots of really cool sex startup companies out there too. So if we can take the idea of an embodied robot, sex robot, and we can work that into a sex toy, and we can make something immersive or something that can hug you or something that you can touch and it will respond, there's so many more cool things we can do without it looking human. And the human thing is really a bad idea for sex robots. First, because we are bloody awful at making humanoid robots. We just can't do it. We're terrible at it. Secondly, they take up a lot of room. Uh, you've got to find somewhere to store them. <laughs> and, and, um, and they're expensive. And, you know, they're not very convincing. So why can't we do something more interesting? And also, we don't want to go down the whole road of objectifying with a very reductive stereotype of a female body. And so two years ago at AMF camp, um, to, to the shock of Goldsmith's Hacksmith's team, I announced that we were going to run a sex tech hackathon, um, which was a bit of a surprise to them. Um, we did, in fact, they did, because they did most of the work. And it was the most incredible event. It was so much fun. So for two years, we ran sex tech hack. And I had this vision that it would be 10 people in a room sewing up vibrators and gluing them back together. They were like, no, <laughs> we're going to get 100 people in a room and we're going to do this and that and that. And we did, they did, and it was phenomenal. And hopefully there will be, I'm going to announce it again on the stage, hopefully there'll be another one, I've got to talk to them. Um, so the headlines that came out of that were much better. So we got some really interesting coverage and um, we were covered by New Scientist, by Elle magazine, by The Guardian, by The Observer, um, by The Independent. And this whole idea that we could take the technology and build something customizable and personalizable and, and try and find something that goes away from the idea of a humanoid sex robot and towards something that fosters intimacy, not just sex, but intimacy. Expand teledildonics into a realm where it's more um, uh, immersive, more wearable, all that kind of stuff. And it's been really, really good fun. So I think that the kind of takeaway from this is that, uh, well, the takeaway, first takeaway is never read the tabloids, um, but you don't do that anyway. The, the takeaway from it is that when you see a sex robot headline, you can guarantee someone's being hysterical somewhere and there's a whole load of moral panic going on because you know, there's, there's really nothing there. Of course, there's some, interesting, there's some interesting things that we need to think about. What does it mean long term for people? I mean, we've been human for millions of years. We're very, very good at getting on with other humans, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. We're, we're completely safe. Um, so yeah, I so saw basically I went, I went and wrote a book um, on it um, where I basically debunked all the headlines and now I'm going to try and sell the book and no one's going to want to read it because it's, it's boring because <laughs> it debunks all the headlines. Um, I say that as I'm about to prompt you to, to, to buy it. Um, <laughs> but it does go into a lot more detail. You can get a discount as well. Um, it does go into a lot more detail because there, I haven't even touched on sort of the ethical arguments. There are a lot of those and there are I do have concerns. I'm not kind of like, oh yeah, we should all just go and build sex tech left, right and centre. I mean, you can if you want, but 
there are concerns. There are concerns around the ethics. There's concerns around what this means, particularly um, in terms of sexism and objectification, particularly in terms of who has, who has access to this? What are the legal things around it? What is this utopian vision? Why are we fed a particular narrative about the sex robot? Why is it always the femme fatale? Why, do we ne why are all the male robots that we see, why are they always, you know, killing machines that eventually have a redemptive heart of gold? You know, there's all these stories we've been fed for so long and they really do affect our perception of, of where technology will go in the future. So I think that's been a very interesting thing and there's a lot of work going on at the moment on narrative in robots and AI because it does matter. The science fiction we read, that does matter. It does shape what we think and it does help us decide how we're going to design things. Um, but I just want to say, in, in the world of sex tech, in the world of intimacy and technology, it's wide open. That's not supposed to be a pun. <laughs> um, it's wide open. The, you know, this, the, there's, there's a whole world out there um, where we have incredible materials to do really cool stuff with. And I think that we can use it to enhance relationships, be it you know, to get away from this idea of some mono-heteronormative relationship where it's a man, a woman, or a penis and a vagina, and it must be an orgasm, no, 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 no. I think that's such a, a, a you know, redundant view of sex, it's such a very cliched and narrow view of sex. We can do much more interesting things in much more intimate ways. We can enhance and, and mediate relationships through technology, and I think that's a good thing ultimately. So I would say that the technology is a good thing. Um, and we should not fear the sex robots uh, and just really do better. Thank you. <laughs> I think we get to do questions. Because um, no one's coming on to talk after me, if you do have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer them. It's the coolest microphone ever. <laughs> okay, so um, the humanoid sex robots are very kind of definitely on the robot side. But when you get to things like kind of teledildonics or even sort of semi-autonomous sex toys, where do you say the boundary is between sex toys and sex robots? Yeah, that's something that I find it really hard to decide. So it's a question that where, what's the boundary between a sex robot and a sex toy? And I think that's really hard to determine because you could have something, I don't know, there's kids in the audience, can I, can I use the word fucking machine? Uh, there's, there's, there's things that kind of blur the boundaries between them. And teledildonics as well, they've got, there's, a, there's an automation there. I think most people are using sex robots to mean the humanoid form ones. Um, to my mind, it's a robot if it performs a, a task um, in an automated way and also has a degree of AI. I know robots don't have to have a degree of AI, but that's what I would count as it. Sex robot. Earlier on, we listened to a talk about um, a gentleman who was discussing hacking light bulbs, and you touched on it very briefly with uh, sex toys that had been breached in some way. In the highly likely event that early sex robots will end up being breached, and seeing some of those fear-mongering headlines, do you think that that could lead to people becoming more afraid, not only because of are they going to ruin a relationship, but also because of is everybody going to know? Yeah, I, I, I actually, I was sort of hopeful that people see this, that they'll get more cautious about um, security and privacy. And there was, um, there was an MP, um, Chiam Mora, who's the MP for Central Newcastle, who is an engineer, wrote an article for The Guardian about is this what will make us all be more careful about privacy when she wrote about the sex tech hacks? Um, so yeah, I think, it's, although they have put some, I mean, um, the Samantha robot deliberately isn't, um, isn't connected, uh, is it has, it has no connection to the Internet of Things, so um, for that specific purpose. So, sorry, did that, did that answer, was another part of your question? It was just whether or not that would make people, the general public, more afraid. More afraid. Yeah, I think there is, 
it's it's really it's really strange to to see what the different reactions are to sex toys in general because I think quite a lot of people there's there's this, well there's a distinct generational gap but um, there are a lot of people that are very reticent to even engage with the idea of a sex toy smart or otherwise so um, I think we've still got a lot of I, th I think there's a lot of people kind of um, 20s upwards that are starting to get do more and more really cool things in, in sex tech but I think the older generations are sort of lagging behind in that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I love this mic. Do you know there's a job, uh, jobs for tasting uh, tea and uh, tasting wine? Is there jobs for sex, tested sex <laughs> robots? And if so, what's the criteria? <laughs> There is actually, there are loads of sex toy tester jobs out there. There are people who do, do, do that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you get into it as a career. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you if, you, if you start researching sex tech, you get sent an awful lot of sex toys. I have an office full of sex toys. And, and what about, uh, and what, it's what a perk about, of the job. <laughs> and what about the robots as well? Is not the robots. I was, I, I've, been, I've been offered a robot head. Um, I have not yet got it. Um, Oh, I hope, hopefully I will obtain a robot head. I, I really just want it for sort of talk purposes and no other purpose. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much. <laughs>